Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today here for the start of the series of our big conversations. Today's topic is whether the Mental Health Act helps or hinders an individual's recovery, and I'm so excited that you can join us today. I have a wonderful panel here that I'll introduce to you in a moment, but I would like to start by commencing um, this particular series with acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet here, which is the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, but also the many lands that all of you join us from too, and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. And of course, it's events like this that it's timely for us to acknowledge people living with mental health issues. The wisdom, the experience, the perspectives and the viewpoints of people who live with mental health issues, our consumer and survivor movement is absolutely integral to the work that we do at Being, but also, I know, to that broader landscape within mental health. So um, our webinar today is being hosted by Being Mental Health Consumers. And for those that are not aware who we are, we are the New South Wales Peak Body speaking with and for people who live with mental health issues. And we do have a particular focus on people who access public mental health services. And so today's topic in talking about the Mental Health Act will be quite relevant to many people who do access public mental health services. So um, I would like to also uh, introduce our panel today. We have a wonderful panel here of um, Catherine Lowry, our New South Wales Mental Health Commissioner. Welcome to you, Catherine, and thank, thank you for, for joining us. Thank you for the invitation, Irene. It's and great to be here. As always, thank you. And also, can I introduce you to Maria Bassoni? And Maria is the Deputy President of the, of the Mental Health Review Tribunal. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, for and thank me. you for joining us. More than and welcome. I, and I do have to say that the three of us are here in a studio. We are social distancing um, and um, ticking our boxes in that regard. So uh, so we're, um, it's really good that we can be here and join you and also for you to be joining us too. Just a couple of housekeeping um, points to note. We are hoping that this um, webinar will be interactive. We really do want you as the audience to pose some thoughts to us around whether the Mental Health Act helps or hinders your recovery. Whether the Mental Health Act helps, and hind or helps or hinders your loved one's recovery. And this is our hot topic. We do believe this is the start of our conversations today and our intention is to continue these conversations on an ongoing basis because we do realise that this is around mental health, it's around human rights, social justice, equity and equality for people who live with mental health issues. It's an incredibly contentious topic, but it's a really important topic and one we have to have. So unfortunately, um, in today's webinar, we won't be able to address individual specific circumstances in regards to the Mental Health Act or the Mental Health Re Review Tribunal. Um, can I suggest to you that if you are wanting to speak to someone, that you contact our office or alternatively our Being Supported line on 1800 151 151. So it's really about us opening up a platform for this big conversation to talk about whether the Mental Health Act helps or hinders an individual's recovery. Um, also, um, I have a lovely iPad here with, um, which will relay to me your questions and, uh, and I'll be able to pose them to the panel. But I do have a series of questions that, uh, that I'd like to put before the panel and, um, and I'm going to turn to them right now with that. So our first question is over to Maria. And Maria, this really sort of starts the, I suppose it's, it builds on the foundations of the discussions for today. As Deputy President of the Mental Health Review Tribunal, you would be familiar with the New South Wales Mental Health Act, and it might be beneficial to set the stage for our audience. What is the Mental Health Act, and is it unique to New South Wales? Okay, so the Mental Health Act uh, is a law passed by Parliament uh, that sets out the, uh, the duties, roles and responsibilities of uh, clinicians in relation to the admission 
assessment, uh, ongoing care and treatment, uh, mostly of persons who are admitted to facilities uh, as, in invol as involuntary patients and uh, who uh, continue to have compulsory care in the community. Uh, it also uh, sets out the role of the tribunal as the independent umpire, if you like, mm -hmm. as to whether or not uh, ongoing care and treatment on a compulsory basis uh, is appropriate, having regard to certain specific criteria that uh, are set out uh, in the Mental Health Act. Uh, tribunal hearings are mostly constituted by uh, three people mm -hmm. uh, with different professional backgrounds. The hearings are chaired by a lawyer, there is a psychiatrist, there is a third member who brings some professional expertise uh, in relation to uh, mental health. Mm -hmm. The tribunal's powers um, uh, are quite uh, broad in a way. Uh, the uh, tribunal is, does not have the formality of a court. Uh, it is uh, a, meant to be a non-adversarial, um, have a non-adversarial focus. Uh, and decisions of the tribunal uh, have to be based on evidence that is presented to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and what the tribunal does, if you like, is uh, make inquiry, uh, collect the information from all the participants in a hearing, uh, and with that information, uh, make a decision as to whether or not the application before it um, uh, should be made or not. The uh, Act uh, sets out uh, a important criteria in relation to whether or not persons can be uh, detained and treated against their will. And I think it's important to remember that the Mental Health Act, the, the Mental Health Act that we're working with today is the culmination of an Act that started a very long time ago, but thankfully, uh, over the last two iterations of the Act of 2015 and 2018, there has been a greater recognition uh, of the rights of consumers and carers, such that now in the principles for care and treatment, uh, there is a presumption that persons, despite being under the Act, uh, can consent to their treatment, and if they're unable to, if they lose uh, capacity to do so for a period of time, they should be supported in making treatment decisions. There are another other important presumptions, if you like, in the Act, mm -hmm. and that is that involuntary care should be the care of last resort. Mm -hmm. The presumption is that people that need to access mental health care do so on a voluntary basis. Mm -hmm. That's an ongoing obligation of all persons, all actors, uh, from the beginning, from the moment that a, uh, uh, let's say, a doctor considers that a person is uh, going through a period of mental distress, there has to be thought considered as to whether or not there are less restrictive alternatives that could achieve uh, care and treatment for that person. Just to drill down a little more, uh, uh, the Act uh, also allows uh, consumers an opportunity to uh, revisit, if you like, uh, their ongoing uh, care and treatment as involuntary patients. There are review hearings held by the Tribunal. Uh, the very first hearing is called a mental health inquiry. Now, that first hearing normally takes place two or three weeks after a person has already been detained and the law allows the um, administration of medication and treatment by an authorised medical officer prior to any tribunal hearing. But having regard to um, professional standards and there are standards set out in the Act. The 
tribunal can hear appeals from persons who are in a mental health facility from the moment that they are taken to a mental health facility mm -hmm. uh, because any person who is so detained can make an application uh, to be discharged from a mental health facility. And if that's refused or not dealt with, there is a right of appeal to the tribunal to consider that question. The later iterations of the Act also recognise the important uh, role of carers uh, and the importance that of, of their uh, ongoing relationship with consumers and the fact that carers do need to share some information, not all information, mm. to be able to assist a person uh, in their recovery. So an important thing to think about, though, is that the tribunal has, I think probably over the last decade or so, sought to approach its task by trying to emphasise the importance of the consumer and their voice mm. in a hearing. So mm. I'd like to think that our tribunal has evolved and is evolving in a way that places the consumer at the centre of, of the hearing mm. and the tribunal genuinely is interested in the consumer's voice and in their wishes uh, mm. and in their desires to you know, live a life as, as, as best they can with or without symptoms of mm. distress. Mm. I, I'll just go to the second part of your question. That's mm. a very long-winded answer. Yeah, no, that's right. Thank you. <laughs> so, and sorry about the laughing. <laughs> um, is it unique to New South Wales? No. Uh, all states and territories in Australia have a version of the Mental Health Act that we have in New South Wales. And they are broadly similar in that... Uh, uh, there's an independent umpire to make decisions in relation to whether compulsory treatment is necessary. Mm -hmm. There is a presumption of capacity to make decisions uh, for themselves. There is, again, uh, the, uh, the right of consumers to access treatment, but in, the, in a way that is least intrusive and as respectful uh, as possible in relation to their human rights. So they're, they're the, broadly the same uh, features. The constitution of panels uh, can uh, differ. I can say to you that all mental health acts share in common a recovery focus. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I could say that in, in, in Australia-wide, uh, the recovery focus is embedded in all the acts in Australia. Mm. Uh, so mm. that's really great to hear. So Maria, just um, correct me because I might be wrong with this. So that that component of recovery, that's a much more recent um, inclusion in the mental health. Act, yes, isn't it, it is. Yeah. Yes. OK. Yes. It stems back from 2015. So yeah. it is it is a recent inclusion. And um, uh, and and I think recognises uh, that good practice uh, entails uh, looking at the whole of the person mm, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and and people's right to 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 get well and to have full citizenship mm, um, mm. and full participation mm, uh, in mm. the community mm. yeah I really like you mentioning about um, the mental health review tribunal and acknowledging consumers in the tribunal setting because what we hear is a lot of people that may not necessarily understand the Mental Health Act, might not necessarily understand the Mental Health Review Tribunal and the processes, mm. um, and of course have a belief that it's almost like a fait complete, that it's, mm. it's um, you know, going before the tribunal means that inevitably they will be an involuntary um, patient or an involuntary client of services for a prolonged period of time. So it's great to hear that the consumer's voice is heard Yes. in tribunal hearings and it's yes. an important factor. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I agree. It is really important. I think mm. the tribunal over the past few years has brought in some measures. They may not be perfect, but some 
measures to try and enhance the consumer's voice. Mm. Uh, the first thing is that we've done a lot of training around recovery and trauma-informed care. Uh, we have also, um, I think, culturally changed to approach our hearings in a way that are therapeutic when they can be. Mm -hmm. So no person should leave a tribunal hearing mm -hmm. feeling worse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, the idea of therapeutic jurisprudence, I suppose, is the idea of um, being able to heal, mm -hmm. uh, uh, being able to uh, approach something in a way that enhances mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. someone's sense of well-being, mm -hmm. someone's health. Uh, and that's been a really important uh, focus of the tribunal. Look, we're not perfect. We have 150 members. We cover the entire state. We do about 18,000 and a half hearings a, a year. Uh, but my sense is, and I think, you know, very recently we've appointed new psychiatrists who are working at the coalface and I was very heartened to hear that a psychiatrist who recently attended to observe hearings uh, came back with excellent feedback, which was, you know, how, um, uh, how genuine panels are in seeking out the consumer's views, mm. taking the views into, taking their views uh, into account and approaching um, uh, approaching consumers and all participants uh, with dignity and respect. So mm -hmm. I think that we, we are moving in the, in the right direction. And the, we've also some years ago, this is not used very much, uh, but we've uh, put together a client information sheet just so for consumers, if they wish to um, give information to the tribunal in another format, uh, they can do so by writing uh, their, their thoughts, their wishes at a tribunal hearing, mm. uh, so we can take that into account. That does not become part of their um, their hospital file or their mm. community file. It's simply a matter for the tribunal. And the other thing that I have been keen about and keen to continue to pursue is the invaluable role of peer workers, mm. Uh, mm. both in... Uh, supporting, I think, consumers at hearings mm. because if I was a person attending a hearing, I'd be pretty frightened thinking, well, there are a whole lot of professionals here sure. uh, and, you know, the, the, it's all going to be stacked against me. Not in 77% of cases, people are legally represented, but there are cases where people are not uh, legally represented. And I would think this is not a very level playing field. Mm. You know, we'll, mm. I, I would be really anxious mm. that what I've got to say about my care and treatment uh, could be lost mm. amongst all that. Mm. Um, so I am very uh, keen uh, to have uh, peers involved in tribunal hearings. Uh, and actually, I think there's a very strong case for having peers involved at every point mm. along the mm. along the journey. Mm. I would love to see um, peers involved, even in that initial phase when, mm. you know, it's been considered as to whether or not mm. a person, you know, has to uh, 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 be involuntarily mm. detained at each point, at each and every point of the journey. Mm. I think mm. that that would be um, uh, invaluable and really um, helpful for people's recovery. Mm. Yeah, I think I'd be in agreement with that. <laughs> Can we come back to that topic of peer workers? Because I would like to talk to, about that a little bit later, but I'm going to pose a question to Catherine now. Um, so as commissioner, you would connect with many people across New South Wales who access mental health facilities and may find themselves within the Mental Health Act as a voluntary or involuntary patient. Um, or potentially family or carers who may have loved ones who find themselves within the Mental Health Act. What are you hearing from your travels when you're talking to people about their views of the Mental Health Act? Uh, well, we've been hearing a lot. Um, over the last 18 months, the Commission, as many will know, have been um, listening to people across New South Wales when we've been doing our midpoint review of Living Well. 
and we've travelled to over 60 communities. We've had about 3,000 people engage in this process. And the Mental Health Act comes up. Um, and whilst we can recognise that the Act provides um, guidance to um, services and clinicians, and as Maria pointed out, is also to um, really um, outline, in one sense, the kind of the rules of the game in terms of how you can access treatment and the care and the provisions um, under that. But I think um, fundamentally what we hear is maybe two or three things. So I'll go for three. Mm -hmm. um, the, the first thing um, I think very much is about recovery and how can recovery be um, supported in an environment that really has a power imbalance mm -hmm. where um, your self-autonomy is um, taken away from you, especially when you are having involuntary treatment or an involuntary admission. And so what does that do for your sense of identity, you know, your, your personhood? And when we look at recovery and the elements of recovery, you know, about connection, about um, hope, identity, I mean, having um, the opportunity to, you know, be meaningful and to be empowered in your life, mm. um, those um, provisions of the Act which take away your, your power are, are very um, meaningful and impactful upon individuals. And I think when you look at, um, at the course of a person's recovery, um, an inpatient episode may be a very short time in their life, you know, mm -hmm. through the year, but it can have quite a large mm -hmm. impact. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, as Maria also pointed about, you know, trauma-informed care and understanding trauma-informed practice, and I think that's the other thing that, that again comes up, that um, whilst even people will say, look, I really did need to have um, an involuntary admission and I'm really pleased that I had the opportunity to do that. Um, there always comes that other side of it about um, the the potential and the risk about um, placing people in an environment that could be traumatic mm. and not mm. Um, mm. therefore reinforcing their mm. their recovery and also the way, therefore the way that they can engage um, with the therapies and the supports that they, you know, will engage with when they're um, mm. in an inpatient unit. So I think that really um, from what, you know, you, you hear across um, New South Wales, um, I think people, you know, can say, yes, it has been, you know, on occasion exactly what I, I've needed mm. um, to have that, um, that care. But again, that care can come with some risk. Mm. And, um, and if we are looking at recovery in that larger picture, it doesn't always um, support recovery, support people's autonomy. So how do we balance mm. that out? And I think the other um, thing that I hear a lot is about um, the impact, therefore, of people willing to engage and reach out to a service. Mm -hmm. So if you have had a, a previous involuntary admission that um, you know may have been very traumatic for you or for your family, then do you want to reach out again? And, mm, and what mm. does that mean when um, we want a, a, a mental health system that supports people when they're feeling distressed, to feel safe, to feel supported and to have their mm. recovery reinforced? Um, that's, a real, that, that's a real issue. And we, we hear um, a lot around that from um, carers as well who may um, see that the, that the person um, in their life may not wanting not want to engage because of when I went to that emergency department, um, I had a bad experience and that led to me being involuntary mm -hmm. um, detained under the Act. I don't want to go back. The, the care or the family member can see that the person is in need of support. They know if they then take steps that can trigger a whole cascade of events. It's a really complex issue and I think mm -hmm. that whilst um, the Mental Health Act was established in one way to provide um, assurance of service um, provision around guidelines, and of course it, it is it is broad. The act, you know, includes things like the official visitors. You know, there mm -hmm. is a level of, of scrutiny and oversight. But um, 
But I think at the heart of it, what's the impact upon the person and their mental mm, health? Mm. And how does it um, enable in its implementation um, recognition of the person's own trauma, um, the person's own experiences, and that whole um, issue around recovery, which is it should be person-led mm, mm. and um, and that person should have choice. So wherever you have... Um, um, you know, in involuntary treatment or um, or treatment which you um, do not consent to, you know, there are difficulties set up. And I think um, essentially it is about that that power imbalance mm. that um, mm. that legislation can um, really place upon that whole dynamic for the individual. Mm. So. What does that mean going forward and what does that mean for future reforms? As Maria said, we've already had some iterations of the Act mm -hmm. where we've been improving um, practice to more contemporary approaches. What does that mean going forward? And and I think my, my last comment will be that also when we did um, travel around New South Wales, there will always be someone who says, why do we have to have an Act? Yeah. Um, you know, can't we do this um in other ways that um, aren't almost as punitive mm. um, because I have um, experienced mental health issues in my life. Mm. How can we have options that um, that can get in early for us to feel safe rather than um, end up being in an environment where we're involuntarily um, admitted? And I think that's, um, that's a really important discussion to have. Yeah, absolutely. I really like you talking about power and that power differentiation, that power imbalance that exists. And, you know, we've spoken about trauma-informed practice as well and um, what's the interplay between trauma and power. And, mm. and I do want to come back to that as well as peer workers, if you don't mind. Um, but in thinking about some of your comments, Catherine, I, I want to pose a question to Maria, which is you mentioned that the Mental Health Act is a legal document. Um, what part does the Mental Health Review Tribunal play in the Mental Health Act a little bit more specifically? And you've outlined some of that already. But when we think of that, um, you know, Catherine mentioned about that power differentiation and um, how we try to find balance. How does the Mental Health Review Tribunal really try to find that balance? And you mentioned about including consumers, including family members. But can you expand any more on that? Um. I think that most panels uh, would recognise that uh, there is a power imbalance. <laughs> there is no question. It's about uh, what can be done in the context of a hearing uh, to, to address that and to, um, in effect, um, provide opportunities to maximise a person's autonomy, mm. even in the mm. context of a hearing. Um, so, as I said earlier, I think that certainly um, there has been a lot of training about the the approach that uh, tribunal members uh, should take in hearings. And my impression is that you know most panels try and do their their best. Mm. Um, I think that. Uh, you know, I think in the context of a hearing, I think that the, 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 the tribunal just explaining its role uh, to uh, a consumer who attends is really important. One of the first things I think the tribunal, you know, should explain is that we're not an extension of the Ministry of Health Mm. Uh, uh, because some people will will see that mm. will think well mm. you know the the, the 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 tribunal is funded by the Ministry of Health what's mm. what's the mm. difference is really to um, impart that the tribunal is a, a truly uh, independent uh, body uh, but the tribunal has to also explain that we can only make our decisions uh, based on the evidence that we have before us. Mm. So it does require the tribunal, I think, to um, uh, aid to try and redress the power imbalance by 
really dispensing procedural fairness mm -hmm. in the court mm -hmm. context of the hearing. That is that, you know, people who come before the tribunal are entitled to um, hear, if you like, the case against them, mm. uh, be uh, fully uh, apprised uh, in a way that gives them a reasonable opportunity to respond to the things that may be in a report. And just in that context, I'll segue to uh, the role of advocates in hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people are able to get the, um, the services of the mental health advocacy uh, service to assist them at hearings. And we had come up against this ridiculous thing that uh, lawyers couldn't get, uh, couldn't get hold of the papers or access to a consumer until the morning of a hearing. Mm -hmm. And more recently, uh, there was a hearing where uh, the, uh, the, the private lawyer in this instance was said, well, if you want the reports for the hearing, you have to go to medical records. It'll take you probably three months mm. to get access to the reports. Now, that mm. is just not procedurally mm. fair. Mm. The tribunal's got a practice direction uh, which specifies the time frames that uh, lawyers and consumers should have access to information uh, in order to allow them to properly prepare for hearing and put their case. So mm. that is one way of trying to uh, redress that uh, power imbalance. Um, so I think procedurally uh, fair hearings is, is, is key to try and uh, uh, ameliorate that, um, that disparity. And I think that the other thing is that the tribunal's role um, used to be seen as um, perhaps being a bit differential to mm -hmm. um, medical opinion. And uh, I've been very keen, uh, and the tribunal's executive has been very keen, uh, to make it clear that the tribunal does have a legitimate role in, in exploring treatment at hearings, because essentially when we're making an order for someone to continue, we are authorising their ongoing care and treatment. So it does have a legitimate role in properly reviewing and asking questions mm. about treatment and also seeking from the consumer what works best for them. Mm. Mm. Because even though, and I'll probably come back to this later, um, even though the uh, principles for care and treatment speak to now a um, a presumption that someone is capable of making decisions and that a person's consent should be obtained to treatment. Uh, th that's not always apparent that, that, mm. that, that those, those conversations have been had. And it's been apparent to me that they haven't uh, occurred prior to a hearing and sometimes a tribunal hearing uh, is the first opportunity for there to be mm, an exchange mm, mm. of information and views. So they're just some of the some of the things that I can think of. Great. Thank you. I'm just having a look to see if we have some questions. Please feel free, our audience out there, to pose any questions that you'd like to us, um, and I'm happy to put them forward to the panel. Um, Maria, something that we continuously hear at Being Mental Health Consumers is that, um, that you know, that, that intersection between there's a legal document, people not understanding a legal document, not understanding their 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 human rights under that document, um, but also to sort of to bring back that power imbalance, that um, procedural fairness. I mean, there's so many aspects for an individual to consider. How can someone possibly consider all of that um, when they're unwell and potentially at their most unwell? Um, and it's probably not a question I'm posing to you. It's more just me speaking out loud because we have so many people who contact us who say they don't understand the process. Um, you know, we have people who, who contact us and say, I didn't even know that there was a Mental Health Act. The first that I found out was being detained against my mm. will mm. and uh, nobody really explained to me that there was a Mental Health Act and mm. that I could be detained. 
mm. um, or individuals who, um, you know, who might be informed to just go into hospital for a, um, a medication update, for example. You only have to be in there for a couple of days only to find out that then they potentially will be detained against their will mm. in the event that they do become unwell mm. and the treating team feel that there may be some risk to themselves mm. Mm. or potentially risk to others. Mm. So so I guess I am speaking out loud here and probably just making a, a comment that's based on what we're seeing at Being Mental mm. Health Consumers, the feedback that we're receiving. And I suppose it probably leads quite well into the next question to Catherine is that... Um, humanization of what is a legal document mm. so on mm. one hand we have a legal document on the other hand we have people we have real humans human beings we have people with feelings and emotions and life experiences mm. and potentially trauma histories and how do we get the two to marry up if they even do so I suppose I will come to that next question, <laughs> Catherine, um, which is um, many people who access mental health services believe that recovery takes place in the communities of their own choice rather than in mental health facilities. What are your thoughts and what are you hearing from the community out there? Um, look, I think that um, the first principle of recovery is that it's person-led and therefore that, that goes that, that, as I was saying earlier about, you know, empowerment about the decisions across your life or those domains of your life that um, support your recovery. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, that includes whether you need specialist um, inpatient care or whether you need specialist care in the community. But of course, recovery is not only about um, medical support, it's about housing and mm -hmm. education mm -hmm. and, you know, having a, an income to, to live a life and your connections, etc. So um, I think when we're talking around, um, you know, what are those tensions, it, it really is to say and, and recognise also that everyone's different. Mm, mm. So what does that mean for them? Mm -hmm. And I think um, it's really, f for me as Commissioner, important, while we're talking about the um, Mental Health Act, is also just to remind ourselves about what the Mental Health Commission Act says. So... I will just read, I think this is important, that in our Act it says that people who have mental health issues, whether wherever they live, should have access to the best possible mental health care and support. People who have mental health issues and their families and carers should be treated with respect and dignity. Mm -hmm. And that the primary objective of the mental health system should be to support people who have a mental health issue to participate fully in community life and have meaningful lives. So that's the overarching position of our Commission Act. Mm -hmm. And I think it really speaks to this, doesn't it? That, mm -hmm. um, that recovery and the way that our system is designed should be about to give people choice and opportunity to lead the life that they need. Mm -hmm. They should be able to have the right to care when they need it, and um, and as I said, I I believe in the way that that um, that section that I just quoted is about to live, you know, meaningful and and lives and fully participate in the community. Mm. We know that that means it is all of the domains of a person's life that you should have safe, stable housing. You know that um, mm. you should have you know best quality care. That it should be made um, available. You know when you need it, and that you have choice. And I think that's the um, the really interesting thing when we do look at, um, again, at the Act around what does it mean for choice and what does mm. it mean when, um, when people, um, as you said, aren't in a position to exercise that choice. So I think when we look at the other issues um, that could impact upon that, whether um, that's a carer or family advocate, whether that's a peer advocate, you know, mm -hmm. on your behalf, whether you have, you know, the equivalent of a um, advanced, you know, care directive when you say, well, when I'm in this circumstance and I become unwell, this is what I would like to happen. You know, mm -hmm. I think that really needs to be um, supported and mm -hmm. enhanced because everybody should be able to make those choices in their life and have um, those opportunities there. And if our system um, doesn't have those range of options, then I think people are limited. But I think also, um, 
having sat in only um, a couple of the hearings of the tribunal, I think the tribunal also needs to know what options are available when they are making um, their decisions. And so I think that's really important so that um, wherever you live across New South Wales, you should have the options for um, community al alternatives rather than an extended inpatient um, stay. You know, mm -hmm. I think this is the whole thing. It's about understanding that system from mm -hmm. whether do you have somewhere where you could go and live upon, you know, um, the end of your period of um, inpatient stay mm -hmm. to um, what are those other supports or your support networks, you know, um, that can um, support you in, in your recovery journey. And I think that mm -hmm. um, works both sides of that equation when you're talking about what does legislation mean mm, in the real mm, world. Mm. Um, I think the, mm. the, the tribunal equally needs to be able to see that if they say, okay, well, um, you know, a, a community option is the best option here. The tribunal needs to feel um, some level of comfort, I'm sure, about that um, services will be available to be provided mm. and that person will be supported. So they have the best opportunity to... Um, mm to continue on with their recovery. And I think that's um, that's those issues, isn't it, about the real world mm. and what are those choices that people have. Um, and as well as I think how the, the tribunal can see how those um, circumstances are laid out for those people. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really like you talking about the um, sort of that community aspect and particularly sort of bringing it in line with choice and control. And we know that, that are, that's, they're two words that are within the Mental Health Act. And how do we honour that when we do have such legislation? You spoke about dignity mm. and respect and mm. that that's absolutely key and that mm. it's in the Commission's Act yes. as well. Um, I guess when we talk to people who live with mental health issues, our consumer movement, our survivor movement, what we are starting to see that there's a differentiation in the term recovery. So I do want to touch on that for a moment because obviously from a clinical lens, there will be clinical recovery, whereas our consumer survivor movement talk about the importance of personal recovery. Um, and personal recovery is about having choice and having control. And um, for me as a person who lives with mental health issues and suicidal thoughts on a, a regular basis, um, I suppose for my lens is that clinical recovery is about um, treatment um, having clinicians who are in control of situations, having tribunals who are making decisions, um, having potentially being an involuntary client um, or patient rather than actually having my own choice. Um, focus is around mental health and mental health issues as opposed to the whole and the collective of the individual. So it's lovely to hear you say that, Maria, when you talk about the Mental Health Review Tribunal looking at the whole of the individual. Because I do feel, and I know our consumer survivor movement say this all the time, that that's an element that sometimes gets overlooked in mental health services. And so, you know, we, we hear treatment and care and we hear words as that. Whereas for me as an individual who lives with mental health issues, I know that for me, wellness is in the community. It's with my family and my friends and my loved ones. It's being able to work and study and do the things that I like to do that contribute to my own well-being and my mental health. So, you know, where do we find that balance between um, clinical recovery and personal recovery? And it's not to say that it's an either or. I really want to make that statement. Um, it's important to note that for some people, um, personal recovery does include treatment and medication, but it's just that it could be a small part for them as opposed to a clinical lens, which is the entirety of the individual. So um, so as an individual living with mental health issues, recovery in the community also means being able to heal from, from past trauma and intergenerational trauma. And that's something that is definitely um, overlooked from our understanding and what we're hearing from consumers and survivors that's overlooked in some clinical settings. So I do want to touch on that for a moment because we spoke about um, trauma-informed mm. care and trauma-informed practice, and that's really important. Where do we find that recognition of people's histories of trauma um, as opposed to just focusing on an illness-entrenched dialogue, um, that biomedical model of, of, that's focused on illness 
as opposed to what's happening for people or what has happened for people. So that changing that sort of rhetoric from what's wrong with you to what's happened to you or what is currently happening to you and looking at all of those social determinants that exist in an individual's life. I mean, for all of us, regardless of whether we have mental health issues or not, regardless of whether we have a diagnosis, we all have struggles in life. We all have great days and not so great days. And our work and our finances, our housing, our relationships, there's so many factors mm. that contribute to our well-being. So the question is, should it not be the same for people who have diagnoses of mental health issues and who come under the Mental Health Act? Um, I think you're absolutely right. When um, we were travelling around, I think especially in um, in areas where um, maybe more more rural or regional areas, of course, but but this comes up more broadly. You know, when you say, "Well, what what worked for you?" Mm. So when we do these um, um, consultations, the first question wasn't about what's wrong with the system. It was always what worked for you. What, what keeps you well? And it would be family, work, mm. Mm. Um, having something meaningful to do, um, education, but community, you know, connection to culture, um, connection to land, mm. Um, mm. connection to your, your kin and the ways that you work. These were the things that strengthened people. Mm. Um, and, and you would not hear um, generally anything about... Um, treatment or an intervention because it was about what what keeps me strong what keeps me well mm. and I think that was for us really powerful because when you have the conversation the conversation starts from that positive these are the things mm. that I can have in my life these are the things that support my mm. my recovery and have mm. meaning and I think that's um therefore the the impact of um being, um, you know, in an inpatient unit where um, where you may not have choice about that, it is a, the other flip side is about disconnection, isn't it? Mm, mm. So it's disconnection from family or from land. Um, you know, if you have to travel off off country for Aboriginal people, um, it is about you know disconnection from maybe cultural practices that you feel very strong about, and you know you, you aren't able to to do those, mm. then I think I was really interested in um, the, the debate that goes, has been going on for quite a while, you know, since COVID started, which is about what are the issues that we've seen in COVID that have um, been good. And we know that one of the um, initiatives has been um, the rolling out of iPads into inpatient units mm, mm. Um, and um, other units have looked at um, the use of personal um Phones, so people can Skype their family member mm. or um, one mother um, said to me that she can read a book to her children before they go to bed at night. Um, so there are other ways that we mm. can keep mm. those connections that we know are healing connections. Mm. Mm. And again, that goes back to your other question about, you know, practice and and what the, the legislation provides. So um, how do we um, support people to keep connected to the healing parts of their life mm. while they're in um, other um, settings. And I think that's that's key. But um, the flip side about um, um, trauma and trauma-informed care um, is that it can be traumatising to be in an inpatient unit. Mm, and mm. I think, um, you know, there, there are pros and, and cons to that. And so understanding what are the human rights of an individual, they can have a right to care, but they should also have that right to do no harm. And I mm. think that's um, the other issue around how we um, translate um, um, and a, a prescribed environment that the Act can um, say in terms of how... Um, your, your treatment is um, planned, and um, but how it's implemented and the context and the environment of that um, are not at the um, tribunal's control. That's outside your control. You don't go into an inpatient unit and point left and right and say, change that, or oh, that's fantastic. Mm. And the same for the individual. Um, mm. So I think there are many elements, aren't there, that really um, impact sure. upon that person's experience. So 
um, to try and empower people um, to have choice. And I think this is one of the things that um, when we look at the work of um, Danius Pyrrhus, the UN Rapporteur on Mental Health, in one of his reports, when he was talking about um, people having um, non-consensual choice about what their um, treatment would be, is that how do we protect someone's human rights? Mm. Do we need legislation that erodes their human rights? And the opportunities for policy and law reform where people, um, I think he used the expression, have a full basket of options and services that could support them to have supportive care that doesn't um, erode their, their human rights. And I think that's the, the challenge. How do we get the full basket of mm, options mm, for mm, people? Mm. Can I say, I think that that's the larger issue here, isn't it? I mean, when we're talking about personal recovery, you know, what are the alternatives? Mm, and, mm. you know, for example, you know, in other jurisdictions and in, in some places in, in Australia, if you're experiencing uh, signs of distress, uh, you don't. You go to a home uh, where you ha might have a uh, a nurse with a lived experience uh, of illness, and you're in a quite a different uh, environment. And it 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 makes sense in a way, doesn't it? That mm. if if someone would feel more safe, mm. more nu nurtured, more mm. cared for, mm. then you know the person is more likely to trust that that environment will be a healing one mm. for mm. them. And I think mm. the Problem is, you know, the 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 alternatives don't seem to be out there. Mm. I have to mm. be mm. frank. Uh, mm. I, we it it's it's great of us to think about, you know, how do we achieve recovery? But to my mind, I don't think that there are many of the. the I don't think there are models uh, of care uh, in the community that do look at. Uh, psychosocial issues. I mean, you know, if mm. I if 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 I didn't know how I was going to live from day to day, uh, I was disconnected from people. I lived in isolation. I was sent home with a uh, an injection that you know made me feel drowsy and I made me want to smoke all day. How is that recovery? Mm. So I think mm. it, you know there there are larger issues here larger sort of policy issues mm. that need to be really explored um, and they're not things that can be solved by the Mental Health Act. Mm. Mm. You know, I, I, I don't, I don't mm. believe. I think that mm. whilst the, uh, uh, all the players under the Mental Health Act can do the best mm. they can, mm. uh, all this, we're talking, all these changes are huge cultural shifts. Mm. Uh, I couldn't agree more that uh, community-based options uh, for care are always going to be better than being in hospital. It's, I, I can't tell you how many times, how many thousands of hearings I've had where consumers have said to me, oh, I, you know, I just really don't like being in hospital. Mm. I don't think I've ever heard mm. anyone, you know, say that they mm. like being in hospital. Mm. Some people do, I think, mm. uh, acknowledge that they need to be in hospital uh, for a period, uh, you know, to perhaps um, regroup, uh, get to a stage whether they can can leave and continue uh, with their lives, but they usually pretty inhospitable environments. Mm. Mm. And I, I, um, it wouldn't surprise me uh, if people say they're traumatised by going to a hospital. Mm. 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 When we. Um travelled around um, New South Wales over the last 18 months, Maria, we found some really wonderful examples of um, either peer-led services yeah. mm. or um, mm. services that um, had a um, mixed um, um, and maybe if I use the word balanced, but, you know, a, a mixed um, team to, to support individuals. Yes. And... They were fantastic. Yes. Um, as you said, people felt that they were supported, that they were seen as a whole person, not mm. just as a, mm. a clinical diagnosis. Mm. So we have some really good models, but mm. they're just not at scale. Yes. And they're just not available mm. to everyone. Yes. And, um, and I think that's, um, 
that's the the challenge that that mm -hmm. we have mm -hmm. that um, that when you talk to people who are who have um, used those services, they they find them to be incredibly mm -hmm. um, supportive. That um, they could feel safer, that they felt more in control, especially services that, were, that had peer workers, because they really mm -hmm. could connect mm -hmm. and have mm -hmm. that trust and that engagement. Mm -hmm. But um, as I said, some of these, some are maybe funded on a short term basis, or they might be um, one off. But I would have to say, though, it was always so heartening when you went there mm. because you found that um, that team who may not have been used to working, say, with peer workers, mm -hmm. just then realise what the opportunities mm -hmm. that they could provide mm -hmm. to people to go back um, and, and pick up maybe the rest of their lives. And I think that whole issue about, you know, seeing people not as a diagnosis yeah. but as a father or a mother or mm -hmm. a small business owner or whatever um, it is that they um, that is them in mm, their own mm, lives, mm. you know, cat owner, whatever it is, was really important and they could understand, oh, okay, mm. they're really worried about their cats. Mm. They've had to have the neighbour come in and and um, look after their cat and they just had a six-week, you know, inpatient admission to be able to be in an environment where you could um, just say, okay, I'm not feeling so well that you can step up into, get that support. I think it's just, it. these are the things that can be really revolutionary um, but as I said, they're not at scale. Yes. And um, and how do we get that that traction so mm. that um, people do have that choice? But I would have to say also that um, professionals that I've met in the in um, services also feel empowered that they have more choice to offer. Mm. You know, and mm. I think that's that that full basket of options mm. again. Mm. You know. Um, I think you have we have you know mental health professionals who have a um, a real commitment to support people, but mm. um, sometimes you don't always have the tools that you may need. So mm. um, as I said, mm. we've seen some really great examples whether they've been rural New South Wales or Sydney, but um, how we get them up to scale so that mm. there's equity of access. Yes. Mm. And, and options. Mm. Mm. So two really key points that both of you have mentioned. So Catherine, you're talking about sort of that the community connections and what's available, but they're on small scales mm. and limited funding, etc. Mm. I want to talk about that in a moment. But Maria, you're talking about um, policy reform mm. that really needs to take place. And I can't mm. help but thinking about um, uh, crisis interventions. So what does exist prior to people becoming that unwell? What, um, what policies do we have in place? What procedures, what investments of funds mm. do we have in services? And obviously I'm going to spoke about consumer run and peer run <laughs> services. Um, but, you know, we can see the evidence there. I mean, mm. being has been fortunate enough to be funded by uh, the Commission and also by the Ministry of Health to establish being supported, which is a peer run um, warm line Mm. And we're already seeing in the first three months the, the, the incredible impact it's having on people's lives. Mm. People who traditionally may actually access public mental health services, but for many people don't access public mental health services because they're too frightened. Of course. They're yeah. too frightened that they're going to be, they're going to end up in hospital, they'll yes. be detained against their will, and there's a soft landing place for them through the mm. warm line to be able to talk to a peer support specialist at just about general things that are happening in life that contribute mm. to us becoming unwell. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, uh, you know, two really valid mm. points that are there. Mm. One is that that policy reform that needs to take place mm. and how do we make that happen mm. and is that potentially something that being really needs mm. to, to to put a focus on in some mm. of the work mm. that we're doing in, advocate, in advocacy. Mm. Um, but then also how do we advocate for more services, more mm. community-based services mm. that support people yes. in the community to be able to heal um, and to be able to get better? Yes. And inevitably, potentially, it's around wellbeing and making sure that, that, um, that we have those processes in place that may alleviate people mm. from ending up in a crisis situation or having to access 
public mental health services coming under the Mental Health Act, et cetera. I mean, it just feels like it's such a big topic of discussion. It, it really is. And, and I know that we're not going to solve it today. Um, I know that this, this conversation, this big conversation mm, will go yes. on for quite mm. some time. But yes. um, I think they're really important points, mm. um, points to raise. So, Irene, I think that you're talking about a system that's proactive and not mm. a reactive one. And, mm. you yeah. know, and certainly I think that's how one could view the state of the nation <laughs> yeah. at the moment. Yeah. yeah. And I um and I think also um when we do talk about about that point around having people um understand their way through the system, I think mm. that's also really important. So mm. we're also bringing in, you know, our our GPs and the way that, you know, where people may, may go to when they're first feeling unwell. So it is I think why I think um, you know the being supported warm line is so important because mm. it is about distress. You know mm. how do we help mm. people in distress and how do we get in early? And um, and I must admit, you know, when we did go around New South Wales, um, there almost was this phrase that was coined, which was um, um, hubs, not hospitals. Yes, and mm. um, and the hubs being basically mm. community run peer-run alternatives when people are first in distress yes. or unwell, where they can go and feel safe and um, and can get get support and connections, um, maybe into services and then, you know, remain within the community and those other connections. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, um, that's really important when we're looking also at our current environment the well-being and mental health impacts of COVID, um, mm. we can see that people are reaching out more for services. Mm. But we also saw early on in the pandemic that people held back from going to emergency departments, et cetera, in case they would um, become un unwell. And I think that was a real salient um, time for us all to realise what are those alternatives to the EDs, you know, when, when people couldn't reach out. Um, and didn't feel safe to do so from a mm. physical health point of view, mm. what can we learn from that? Mm. And, um, and what can we learn from warm lines? What can we mm. learn from mm. um, having um, online or face-to-face um, -face services that, that you know, shift partially um, to online services? Because we do know that people always don't want to go on and Skype. I do want to have mm. that face-to-face -face connection. Mm. And I think mm. Mm. there there are lots of things, I think, when we talk about the um, the policy reform environment, that I think the pandemic has shifted a lot of things for people. Mm. And, um, and I think that's something to understand when we're looking at access, when we're looking at, say, bushfire-affected communities um, on top of the, the other issues that they may be addressing that impact upon their well-being and mental health. How do we get and support people in an environment mm. where they don't become so unwell that it ends up, um, you know, at a, at a crisis point and mm. that public mental health system gets, you know, starts to kick in in the way that it needs to support mm. people at those times? What are those alternatives? Mm. Mm. It's a very timely conversation. It is a very timely conversation. I probably want to bring us back to um, the topic of peer workers because both of you have mentioned peer workers um, and how instrumental peer workers could be. So how wonderful would it be if we could introduce peer workers to the Mental Health Review Tribunal? Um, but even individuals who are in declared mental health facilities, having access to peer workers is absolutely integral and maybe that's something that we need to advocate for, that each person that comes through the tribunal be offered a peer support worker. So I think there's some mm. further conversations to have. Um, and Catherine, I know that the Commission is right behind the, the development, the expansion of um, the peer workforce and particularly with the, the work of the peer worker hub that the Commission has invested in as well. Is there anything that you want to add around that? Um, I just think it's really um, important at this point in time to understand that um, when we're looking at our community, when we're looking at um, not only the um, growing well-being and mental health needs, but also the needs for employment. Mm -hmm. And when we know that it's a, it's a virtuous um, mm -hmm. circle, you know, employment is good for your mental health 
and um, and peer work um, is um, reinforcing for the individual, but wonderful for their 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 client in terms of modelling hope and recovery. And um, I just think that peer work in this environment also can provide a lot more opportunities to um, people who have that great expertise of um, living with their um, their mental health issue and on their own recovery journey. So I think. Um, Again, the way that we can bring um, peer work much more into when we're looking at these solutions, especially at this point in time, mm. is is absolutely essential. And the wonderful thing about peer work is that you can grow your own, you know. Mm. Um, you can be in a rural town um, and you would have people there who do have their own experiences. So how can we harness that? Um, mm -hmm. I think that's the other wonderful thing mm -hmm. that um, people with lived experience have great expertise that is yet to be harnessed in, mm -hmm. in, into this role. So, mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a, a lot of opportunities there going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and we're certainly seeing that COVID um, for uh, for all the challenges that it's brought, it has brought some really great things. And one of those for us at being is that. Um, we've been able to employ people um, from across New South Wales, which we haven't done previously. Oh, okay. We've mm. been quite metrocentric, mm. um, but now we're able to recruit mm. people, particularly mm. into the being supported warm line, who um, can work from home, mm. who are in rural and remote areas, um, who have experienced the bushfires, for example, and droughts, mm. and have a really good understanding of mm what that's like for their communities mm -hmm. and are then are able to support people who are mm -hmm. in in those types of situations. So uh, so I think, um, you know, I'm certainly a big spruker of um, the peer workforce, <laughs> love it, have been a peer worker for <laughs> quite some time now and, um, <laughs> and certainly, um, you know, being a peer worker has been part of my recovery, actually an mm -hmm. integral part of mm -hmm. my recovery. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. and we know that um, that through the recruitment and the employment of, peer workers that this there's that as I said that wisdom and the expertise that comes with it to bring about system reform and change mm. and leading and influencing as well. And I think um, young peer workers, I think we have to be really mindful about um, the impact that COVID has had on our young people. Mm. And I think um, when we're providing service responses to be able to have young peer workers as mm. well will be mm really important to understand that, you know, you can get through this, you know, there mm. are, you know, there is a way forward. Don't feel that your your life has been blocked off. It, it hasn't. It's going to have to maybe go around mm. around that big boulder, but mm. you'll go around it, mm. you know, and I think that's, mm. that is just where, where peer workers, as you said, that mm. um, hope and that recovery and, and modelling and, um, and modelling that, you mm. know, um, mm. I think is just absolutely fantastic. And I think that's one of the things, um, for those of you who may not know, we've updated our um, peer hub, so um, go check it out. But I think that's really important to understand that um, some people have said to me, you know, when I was on an inpatient unit, I really felt ho helpless, hopeless, despondent. And then this peer worker came up and spoke to me and I realised, wow, that's something I never even thought of in terms of my own career or my, or my own future. And I think the way that that is so powerful, that one-on-one -on -one connection. So absolutely, we'll spruik away there, Irene. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. And I am going to come to the question um, and, and particularly your thoughts around does the Mental Health Act help or hinder recovery? But just in our conversations, I can't help but thinking, if we have such a high percentage of people who access public mental health systems who come from histories of trauma, and that's not necessarily observed as a priority within the mental health landscape, I'm just wondering if we flicked it on its head and, and started looking at trauma and trauma histories as a priority to a biomedical lens of a diagnosis, would we even have a mental health act? Mm. Mm. And That's a great question. <laughs> and is that perhaps <laughs> the way that we need to progress forward? I don't know. What do you think? 
It's a big question to ask, but this is a big conversation. <laughs> so. <laughs> I can't help but think that uh, when one sees the association between trauma history mm. and mental health distress, uh, that uh, addressing trauma should be a high priority. Uh, mm. uh, in inpatient units uh, in the and in the community, uh, and I think that it's... Uh, Fair to say that it is a biomedical model. Mm. The uh, answer for uh, some clinicians, not all, but some mm. clinicians is, you know, starting with medication and then moving to the other things. But I, I you know, have often wondered myself mm. whether or not uh, expanding the range of other options and interventions um, could be a, a way forward that um, may mean that uh, uh, medical interventions or medication it isn't the first thing that you you mm. hop at to mm. to, to try mm. and mm. solve a problem. Uh, you know, I think there are places in the states now where people are admitted to mental health facilities, and you know the first thing they're looking at is diet and exercise. Mm. <laughs> mm. I mean, mm. you know, there's there are a range of things. We know that they're out there. We know that they're emerging. We know that a lot of mm. it is evidence based. Mm. But have they found their ways into into mental health facilities mm. that are, mm. um, you know, run? I think by real. I have to say this. Are run by I think largely really dedicated people mm. who are trying to do the right thing, uh, but have um, a limited range of options or a limited understanding mm. of mm. what is potentially helpful. And that's that. a lot of that information is coming from consumer, the consumer movement mm. and uh, peer workers, and that's why we need to listen to them. Mm. Mm. Yeah, great. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. I think it is that shifting to that biopsychosocial model, isn't mm. it? Mm. And, um, and in that looking at, you know, the alternative, um, you know, approaches that you engage, you know, whether it be through open dialogue, which is a much more mm. inclusive, you know, mm. um, you know, person-led, person-centred mm. approach. So I think there are many different um, ways that we can try and engage that. But um, but I think, you know, when I was saying earlier about, you know, um, hubs, not hospitals, I think that actually was the key mm. about when people are feeling distressed. Mm no matter where that distress comes from, having that as seen as the issue to be discussed, not what your diagnosis mm, is mm, mm, or mm. isn't. And um, and I think that that's what um, I hear when I you know, talk to people and, and, and listen to what they say, which is, well, having this particular mental health issue is a normal response to the absolute trauma that mm, I've experienced mm, in yeah. my life. You know, mm, um, mm. you know, it, it really is putting the cart in the wrong place, you know, sure. and, and addressing my trauma will be the healing. And I think when we look at um, other um, um, approaches, whether it be to um, PTSD, for example, where, where trauma mm. is absolutely front and centre and about mm. how do we manage trauma or address that person's trauma, work through that trauma with that person. Um, you know, I think, there again, there are the areas that we can um, pick up on where that evidence is about what mm. does contemporary practice look like. Mm -hmm. But I think at the core of what we're really also saying is listen to people. Yeah. And really um, listen to them when you are in that therapeutic environment, but listen to them when they're telling you about what they need from their service, you know, mm. what, what they mm. need to keep them well, which does come back to that recovery issue. Mm. Mm. But I would have to say that one of the things that I also um, heard when we were travelling um, is that issue around um, inpatient units can be traumatic for staff as well. Sure. And, you know, so when we're talking about what these environments are, whether people are coming with trauma and how we need to be responsive and supportive of that person through their journey, but when we're placing them in environments that sometimes even traumatise the staff working there, mm. I think sometimes we do need to step back mm. 
mm. and mm. Um, and to think about how is our service supporting the good mental health and well-being mm. of um, the individuals, their carers and families, and and our workforce. And mm. I think when mm. um, um, Dr. Murray Wright did that review, seclusion and restraint, I think that really came very much to the fore about mm. um, how do does how do does that's bad language for a Monday um, <laughs> how um, how approached in inpatient care absolutely must be trauma informed mm, you know and, mm. and I think that's that's something we do have to put extra focus on mm. and something that I think also as I said earlier we have to have people with lived experience at the at the heart of, mm. of leading mm. that because mm. um, it's their trauma. It's mm. their recovery, mm. and um, and they should be the leaders in that. Mm. So, Irene, can I just say that I think that you know, in a in an ideal world, mm. it would be wonderful if uh, in New South Wales, advanced care directives were recognised. Mm. Um, I know that they are in Victoria, uh, but an advanced care directive where someone could articulate when they're you know, in, in the right space, you know, what they would like mm. uh, to set out what they need mm. to heal and to have that respected and acted upon. Mm. I think that would be a huge advance. Yeah, absolutely. I'd agree yes. with you with that. Yeah. Do you think that would be something um, that potentially would need to be in the Mental Health Act? I think this is a very timely conversation mm. given that the Act is due for review either mm. next year or the year after. Mm. But look, it, it, it is, I think, that in Victoria it is in the Act. I think we're somewhat different in that whilst um, the principles for care and treatment speak to uh, obtaining someone's consent to treatment, it's not usually a discussion that takes place at the tribunal level mm. and I'm just wondering whether it needs to be moved, mm. you know, whether the, mm. the, 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 the tribunal takes that issue on, you know, fairly and squarely in the context of a hearing. Mm. But look, I, I do think that, um, that that people should be allowed to uh, articulate their wishes and preferences mm -hmm. for treatment and that uh, it be uh, absolutely uh, considered uh, by clinicians who come in contact uh, with the person and mm. and acted upon, and that could be a document that is mm. cobbled together with the assistance of carers, peers, mm. uh, mental health mm. professionals mm. A, at a time when people are not experiencing distress. Mm. Yeah, really great point. Really great point. I think something else that comes to mind for me is those those three key words that are in the Mental Health Act: care, treatment, and control. Control is gone. Uh, fantastic. Great. <laughs> so care and treatment. Care and treatment are definitely two things that I think are really important to raise because one of the things that we're hearing is that differentiation in, well, we're hearing about language. We're mm -hmm. hearing how important language is for individuals mm -hmm. and that we all interpret language in different ways. So, so, for example, we talk about lived experience. And for me as a person who lives with mental health issues, I don't particularly resonate with the past tense of lived and I prefer the term living experience. Some people don't like the term consumer mm. as well. So it's trying to find that balance. But when we think of care and treatment, um, we're all going to have differentials in our interpretation of care and treatment. So quite frequently we hear from people who will say, well, I noticed that it says care and treatment in the Mental Health Act, but what I'm receiving, I don't believe that to be <laughs> care or I don't believe that to be treatment. Mm -hmm. So I think it's also there needs to be some sort of a recognition around the language yes. and that differentiation of language that mm. interpretations can be quite different mm. as well. Mm. Or you mm. add an adjective, compassionate care. Yeah. And I think that's yeah, what yeah. Um, that um, is said mm. to me incredibly often um, it's not mental health care, it's a mental health intervention. Mm, and mm. Um, because there is no care mm. or I'm not feeling I'm being cared for, for you know. Yeah. And so I think, um, yeah, compassion, empathy mm. are really 
key when we're dealing with human beings who mm. are at a tough time in their life. Mm. And um, and again, back to the other question about, you know, recovery in an inpatient unit, recovery in the community, mm. um, where would you feel that someone is actually caring for mm. you? Mm. Um, and I think that's, you know, you're quite right. It is about language and mm. um, yeah, compassionate care. The, if the adjective could be there or else, as I said, people say to me, it's not care, Catherine, mm. at all. Um, it's, it's a it's a health a mental health intervention. Mm. So mm. I think the thing is, how do we bring that into our services? Mm. How do you make those cultural mm. changes? Mm -hmm. I think having peers there is a good start. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because you know, there's no. I'm just speaking anecdotally, being an observer um, uh, at hearings. That uh, for me, what appears to be crucial is the quality of the relationship between the carers and the consumers. Mm. And uh, it's been evident to me that uh, when there has been, uh, like, you know, meaningful, uh, compassionate uh, care mm. where the whole of the person mm. is considered, where there is a real consciousness of the person's rights as a human being, where there is an attempt to restore and give back control, mm. uh, that they're the types of carers that I think um, uh, play a really important role in a person's recovery. Mm. And you can't mm. legislate for that. Mm. Mm. You can't legislate mm. for cultural mm. change. Mm. It, has to, it has to come uh, through another force. And as mm. I said, I think that the peer mm. workforce is a, is a really good start. Mm. Absolutely, and we've already yeah. seen so much reform over the years yes. um, from having people with lived experience um, mm. not just involved, not participating or engaging, but actually leading some of the yes. reform. Um, and, and the work. And the work. Mm. And we've yeah. seen so many changes already, mm. but I acknowledge we still have a long way to go. Yes. And if, mm. if, you know, if we didn't have so much to go, we didn't have those long distances, mm. we wouldn't be having these sorts of conversations today. We'd already be there. Mm. So I think we have to think of, you mm. know, what do we need mm. to get to the point mm. where we are not traumatising or re-traumatising mm. people, um, where we have spaces where people can heal mm. um, as opposed to, and language that fits for them as opposed yes. to having treatment and care that doesn't necessarily mm. fit? Mm. How do we shift beyond the biomedical lens mm. and that clinical mm. understanding of recovery? Mm. And even over um, overseas in, in a number of countries, we're seeing that there's not just clinical recovery and personal recovery. We're now starting to see social recovery. Yes. Mm. So what is the impact mm. on society, yes. on on the stigma that still exists mm. for people with mental health issues, mm. how that impacts externally for an individual, mm. but internally too. Mm. So mm. I think we all have a responsibility. We all mm. play a part mm. in, um, in, in our communities, in our mm. society, um, and we owe it to all of us to make sure that we're, we're getting it right and we're moving away from harming and hurting people. Mm. Irene, I was just thinking of an example of um, the, the, the powerful... Uh, work of peers, and that is, uh, no, I just can't remember the mental health service, but we're a, a peer with a, a very interesting nickname who I've nearly tried to connect with uh, on the telephone. Uh, because of his uh, involvement in a particular mental health service, their seclusion and restraint rates, which were pretty high, went mm. down to zero. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. It says it all, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a really um, great place for us to kind of to look at wrapping up this conversation. As I said, we're we're um, you know we're just we're just touching the tip of the iceberg yes. here, mm. and, and really at being um, mental health consumers, we do want to continue this conversation. We think it's an important conversation. Um, we're hearing from our members and our supporters and our allies, the consumer movement, the survivor movement, that this is really important to you. So. How do we take this forward? And we really want to get people involved. But I suppose in thinking of wrapping up this conversation, um, I'm going to pose the inevitable question oh. to both of you, Maria. I've been evading <laughs> it the entire time. <laughs> Maria, let's come to you. So, um, you go first, Maria. So what are your thoughts? Do, does the Mental Health Act help or hinder an individual's recovery? Well, 
uh, let me come at this in another way. Yeah. The Mental Health Act, in, in theory, uh, you know, sets out guidelines that are meant to, I think, um, assist recovery. Um, however, I think that we are dealing with uh, human beings and the mm. Act cannot, um, you know, legislate for uh, how people behave. Um, I think the uh, key thing is that uh, the quality of the relationships between carers and consumers is absolutely, I think, to my mind, pivotal to a person's recovery, mm -hmm. uh, as are the as are the opportunities to maximise uh, a person's rights, even within the confines of the Mental Health Act. So, uh, if there if the person is being uh, considered as another whole human being. Uh, uh, who is having an episode that requires some intervention, but there are opportunities to, for the person to choose what assists them. Um, I think that that, uh, I think that, and giving back control as soon as that's uh, possible. I think that those practices uh, would mean that even within the confines of the Mental Health Act, there are opportunities to maximise a person's recovery. Does it hinder or help recovery? Um, it's meant to. Does it always achieve it? I think probably not, to be fair. Mm. I think that uh, you cannot uh, have forced healing. Mm. Uh, however, uh, I think that people in this space are doing their best. And as you say, this is a start of a bigger conversation mm. and we really need to uh, take on board all the, uh, all the wisdom that's out there, the research that is available mm. to us to be able to provide uh, people with opportunities for um, what they need in the community to prevent a crisis, uh, what to give them so when there is a crisis uh, it can be uh, as supportive as possible and what they need to be able to continue to live uh, with or without signs of distress mm. in a way that is uh, the best way that person can live, consistent with their own, you know, desires, their wishes and their dreams and hopes. So I haven't actually answered your question <laughs> entirely. Mm. That sounds a bit like a lawyer. <laughs> I was just going to add that, but <laughs> you've beaten me to beat it. You to it. <laughs> No, yeah, thank they're you. my thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yes. Appreciate that. Um, Catherine, over to you. What are your thoughts? Okay, so I suppose <laughs> my, my my first line really is, well, it really is what the person experiences. Mm. So um, if the Act has supported them to get um, specialist intensive intervention when they needed it, mm -hmm. then it won't be hindering their recovery. Mm. Um, but... And, and that's what, in, in essence, um, the Act should be there for, to provide um, access to specialist care when people need it. Mm. The, the larger question about does that specialist care always have to be in a hospital? Mm. You know, could it be provided in a community? Mm. And, um, and then the context of how that is provided, i.e. legislation that does um, take away choice and um, and can you know when we look internationally about um, you know detention against your will that is a violation mm, of your human mm, rights. Mm. So I think there are you know very um, black and white issues, but of course everything is in the grey, and that is really about how does that person experience 
um, that legislation in, in terms of in, impacting upon their um, access to care or support. But of course, the other issue about um, preserving their dignity, being treated with respect, having um, an understanding of um, who they are and supporting their choice. And I think, you know, the, the issue around advanced care directives, et cetera, really need to um, be seen in an environment where you have the legislation, but there are other issues that um, encircle it. Mm. Um, and I think that's, that's the challenge going forward. Mm. If we had a system that um, had as its premise, and I, I don't mean this, um, you know, I think, I was going to say, I don't think we mean when I say this that um, we don't have a system that has a vision about improving the mental health and well-being of people, but I think if we had a system that we could absolutely hand on heart say it's a system that is there to provide choice, opportunity, early intervention, mm. to be able to provide people to step up into maybe a, a community-based support um, service to then be able to go home or to be able to still go to work but get support, you know, mm. as you need. Mm. We need to have that full basket. Mm. And I think when we understand that um, the legislation is part of that, it might mean actually that if we have all those other elements in place, the trigger for using the Act should decline mm. because people will get support early on. And we did discuss about, you know, getting in early, reducing mm, distress mm, and, and mm. reducing that um, that journey to being really mentally unwell. Mm. And I think that's that would be a, a good thing if we had the Act placed much more in that kind of biopsychosocial environment and we had a system around it mm. where really when, when we do look at, at legislation and the human rights of people, it always is as, at the last resort mm. that um, an mm. intervention to deprive someone of mm. their liberty is there and I think what we really need is to ensure it is last resort mm. it's not the only option mm. and I think mm. in that case you know does it hinder um, recovery I think for many individuals who do get um, absolutely traumatized and I'm, I'm not only talking about the person themselves but their family or their carers or you know their, their children their work colleagues their, their network can also be adversely impacted mm. by by seeing mm. what they what they're going through, mm. but equally, um, we do need to be able to provide services that are timely, best practice, and high quality when people need them. And I think they have mm. that right. So it is about balancing their right to high quality service, mm. which, which is their also their, their human right, a, against being able to um, protect themselves um, in terms of their choice and their decision being treated with dignity and, and respect. Mm. Well, thank you so much. Uh, this, is, this has certainly been some big conversations <laughs> um, and, and as I said, we, we absolutely um, really look forward to continuing the conversations, hearing what our members and our supporters, our allies, um, those that work within the field, consumers, carers, um, we really want to hear from you. We want to hear about this topic um, and we look forward to bringing you some further opportunities to be engaged with us to do so. Catherine, thank you so much for being with us and bringing the lens of the Commission and, of course, Maria, thank you so much for uh, bringing the legal lens but also uh, the Mental Health Review Tribunal. It's really great to have these conversations with you and I do thank you. Thank you. Both. It's been a thank pleasure. You, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> um, so just in wrapping up, um, I'd really like to thank those that have joined us online. Um, look forward to um, being able to read your questions and hopefully being able to respond to them as well. We thank you for joining us. If in the event of this webinar um, anything has brought up any distressing thoughts for you um, or you just feel like you want a peer support specialist to chat to, our Being Supported Warm Line and Peer Support Specialists are there to take your calls on 1800 151 151. Um, pretty easy number to remember, 1800 151 151, it isn't is. it? We did well <laughs> with that. Um, but thank you to everyone. We wish you um, all the best and stay safe and goodbye for now. <laughs>